I live with the agony. It is with a live-in love. See, the agony in my love can offer me more sensation than any Mediterranean sadomasochistic fantasy could ever provide. A gay man in a woman's body. I cry a lot. Do ceremonies. I grease my face. <laughs> I fell in love with Jap because he was in love with Bob. And he, I think at the time, was trying not to be out. And so at a party given by Shari Deans, who was a Hungarian uh, artist, suddenly Jap made a big play for me. And I knew he was a gay, you know, and I thought, what is he doing? But it went segueing into a little more intimacy and uh, me falling in love with him until, until I had the very bad taste to tell him so. And then he dropped me like a hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> and this whole thing was happening at the Delicatessen on 6th Avenue. I mean, it was, it was just a real New York story. So we lived in the same building. He was, you know, on the fourth floor. I was on the fifth. And I was crying all the time because he was with Bob, and I was alone with my cats. And Cy Tomley, who had been in love with Bob, was also alone because Bob and Jap were together. And he and I would cry on each other's shoulders, and we would tell each other how unhappy and sad we were. So it was, <laughs> it was such a mess. How long did you all did you all live together? Well, it was about three years for me. And then, what brought you out here? Ah, you know, my father died here in uh, Beverly Hills, and I felt that if I stayed in New York with all these people around me, I would never find myself because they were so, they were so made. They had been made already. They were already existed as who they were. And they were exhibiting with Leo Castelli oh, already? they were doing everything. And I was still, you know, completely meandering in my labyrinth of not knowing what I wanted to do, who I was, how I was an artist, all those things, and I figured if I don't get away from them, I will never find my voice. And I did get away with, you know, with coming here. I started to teach at Pasadena Playhouse. Why? Why Pasadena Playhouse? Were because you an actress? Because they offered me a job, oh, Molly. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and then they they fired me at the end of the semester because I was a bit much for them. And then what happened? You started your own performance. Then no, no. Um, I started to teach in a little tiny uh, workshop place that I had rented, and I had all kinds of people. I had Vic Morrow, I had Tony Perkins, I had Tab Hunter, I had, uh, you know, all these aspiring stars. They were young starlets, all of them. And instead of doing the usual scenes, I started to teach them the exercises that I was inventing. And little by little, they started to improvise a theater that as I sat in the dark watching that, I was thinking to myself, this is amazing. I have never seen anything like it. We have to go public. So I said to them, guys, we've got to go public. We're doing something amazing. We've really found something new. They all disappeared like rats from a sinking ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were really thinking about their own careers, and you wanted to... Uh, they said my agent would Yeah, be, right. That's you always, know. yeah, yeah. So what happened? How did you begin the workshop so that continued till of today? Of all the people who left, three people remained. One was, um, was um, Lee Mulliken, the painter. Really? He was taking your Absolutely. classes? Absolutely. He was fabulous, and he was in love with my kind of theater. And he was making objects to work with and everything. So I had Lee Mulliken, and I had a little dancer girl who had come in from Pasadena Playhouse to follow me, and a, a uh, boy, a young man from India who was Jewish. And the four of us decided, the hell with it. We'll do it, just the four of us. 
And we started to do it, and at the time, my audience was the, the uh, artists and the poets and the musicians of the Ferris Gallery, because the Ferris here in LA was the only avant-garde place you could go to. And all these people, every weekend, would come and see my show. And so it was. So like it was a Billy circle. L. Bankston and Ed Ruscha and Craig yeah, yeah, Kaufman. Yeah, yeah, all these guys. Yeah. Now you stopped uh, performing in 2000. Yeah. And and uh, you uh, still continue to do the workshops, but you began painting. And I think I was one of the first people to see the paintings based on stories, fables from the Bible. How did this come about? And how did you get into these two shows that now are are the main talked about things in the art world here in Los Angeles? Well, you know, about the shows, they came to me. I didn't of go to them. Of course they would, yeah. And uh, one of them, actually, I'm showing a DVD of my, my performance work. And the other one is uh, more about the um, visual stuff and about the painting. Well, you had, <laughs> didn't you show at, in the uh, show that Lynn Keenholz just uh, carried yeah, on? Yeah, the Pompidou in Paris. And that yes. was one of the first times people had actually seen the work. And then yeah. I came to your studio and saw these wonderful Bible fables and also these fabulous paintings of your dogs. Well, you know, they're my main, my main subject. The Bible stories were just a passing fling. <laughs> it's like but your dog dogs, just woke up. He <laughs> knows he's are. being talked about. <laughs> they're, they're always with me. You asked me if I was ever lonely. I'm never When did you first uh, shave your head? Um, in 81, I did it as part of a piece because I had been, uh, my, my money had been stolen from me, all of everything I possessed. And um, I ended up with nothing, not a penny. And I was, you know, very worried about that. And I figured that um, I would do a piece where somehow I give up like a sacrifice, a part of myself, in order to start over again. And so as part of the piece, I had a young woman shave me. At the time, I had a lot of hair. As a matter of fact, poor Taddy. Taddy was very upset about that piece because he used to ride behind my hair. I had a lot of hair down <laughs> to here. And it was his little place, you know, his little nest. And then suddenly I came off the stage and it was empty. And Taddy <laughs> had lost his hiding place. But anyway, I thought at first that I would grow it back immediately. And then I looked at myself and I said, this is the real me. Finally, this is what I really look like. And I loved myself like that. I would never have the nerve to do that. In talking to you, I see that life has been a lot of meetings and partings. You said you had the same experience with Jasper Johns, that he came out to see a performance and didn't like it, and that was the end of it. But uh, do you think you set those things up so you can keep alone and creating? I just go with the flow very much. And I find that the flow is such that people come and go. Yeah. And also objects come and go. I've lost a lot of objects and I've lost a lot of things. And you know, having been, having been a war refugee when I was 13 and having to leave France and the way in which I was going changed everything for me because suddenly I realized everything is here and then gone. That, that's the way we have to end it, right now. It's gone. I, <laughs> I just cannot thank you enough, Rachel. I know how busy you are, and I'm just so thrilled that you were able to make it and be here with me today. Art is not for everyone. It never has been. It never will be. But for those of you who love it like we do, we want to turn you on. I'm Molly Barnes. Thanks for watching. We mammals know we're off and running. Strategies, breaking treaties, tricking and tinkering and sticking together. We're family. Putting up a front in this new world. Putting on the dog, the rat, the horse, the woolly mammoth.